Hi, everyone. One more, one more lecture before our long weekend. Cruising right along in our semester. I invite you to uh, spend the weekend catching up on your work, making sure you're getting the semester and the year off to a good start. Work hard, play hard, right? Um, but this is a great time to get ahead in your reading. Bio 1B is going to catch up with you really quickly. When the labs get rolling, um, the workload is going to increase dramatically for you. And so now's a great time to get a step ahead. For some of you, ecology is going to be the easy part. This stuff will come naturally, thinking in cycles and levels and interactions. But for others, this is going to be the most difficult. People are really, people do vary in, um, in the success that they have in the different modules in this course. So um, if it's easy now, it may not be in the second or third module. And um, so be careful with that, okay? Um, it's a long semester. It is a uh, marathon, not a sprint in here. So try to keep, uh, keep your energy levels high all semester long if you um, are aiming to do well. I'll eventually, uh, maybe next week, put up some practice questions on BSpace. We'll do that next week um, to give you a sense of how questions are asked on the exam. Those questions that I put up are not meant to um, be as hard or as easy as the questions will be on the exam. Inevitably, when you put up questions like that, you give the exam and people say, oh, it's so much harder than your practice question. Um, okay, then, the questions I'm going to put up on BSpace are going to be easier than the questions on the exam. How about that? I will uh, avoid that problem by saying that now. Um, really, I've put them up to give you a sense of how a multiple choice question in here is structured. Um, the other professors will write their questions differently. Um, but all of the exams in the lecture portion of the course are multiple choice. There's a guide to successful taking of multiple choice exams on the course website, written by John Lotto, a former professor of this course. And you're welcome to look at that if you want to, um, to try to develop some techniques for good test taking. But it's not unlike so many of the exams you've taken to this point in your lives in the multiple choice and the strategies that are important for doing well. I emphasize the conceptual material on the exams. You do not need to know the date of birth of an individual um, who founded a particular topic in ecology. Um, spe in species names are absolutely not relevant for your studying for exams. They may be used, a species may be used in a test question, but you will be given the name. Um, you are not to, not, it's not necessary to memorize those types of things, right? We're Really, memorization itself is somewhat de-emphasized in this module. Um, we're going to be testing on conceptual understanding. If the test is written well, it is going to determine if you understand these concepts. Um, and for some of you, that'll be hard. For some of you coming through a science track, um, and if this is your first course, that's going to be challenging. Because you can't just rely on your memorization. You need to understand the material. And the litmus test of whether you understand it or not is whether you can discuss it, whether you can communicate about it uh, with someone else. Thus, the value of your discussion sections and talking about these issues. Um, great to form study groups in preparing for the exams, uh, small or large, so that you're talking about the things. When these words cross your lips, having been formulated the concepts by your brain, then you'll get a sense of whether you understand it or not. Okay? Sitting down with a book and memorizing it and then coming cold without having talked about it at all into the exam, you're really not likely to do as well. You might do just fine. You know, everyone's different. But that's my advice, to uh, form study groups and to talk about these things as much as possible. Okay. Um, any questions on those things, feel free to email me and I'll address them. We are uh, going to cover a lot today. Um, So let's get right into it. 
<coughs> we are continuing our discussion of population ecology, and we will be looking at population growth models and the phenomenon of exponential growth initially. Then we will talk about constraints on population growth and density-dependent effects on populations and the logistic growth model. We'll be talking about exceptions to the standard models in a brief but important discussion of Ali effects. And if we have time at the end, we'll start talking about predator-prey dynamics. If we don't get to that today, it'll fit just fine in our next lecture on interspecific relationships. Remember our figure um, of a population of sparrows from last time? Let's start to um, become a bit more mathematical in our presentation of populations, in our modeling of populations. Big N represents the number of individuals in a population. That was introduced previously. And we discussed how population numbers can increase through birth and immigration, and popula population numbers can decrease through deaths and emigration. So using capital letters to symbolize those phenomena, you can generate a simple equation where the change in population numbers, delta N, equals births plus immigration minus deaths plus, plus emigration. Let's simplify that and assume that um, immigration and emigration don't exist or they cancel each other out, and we'll focus on the phenomena of births and deaths. Let's talk about population change with respect to time, with respect to concrete intervals of time in a discrete sense, in this, the sense of discrete population growth, either across the lives of individual organisms during the lifetime of an individual, or across generations of reproduction from one generation to the next. Some discrete interval that we represent by delta T, the change in time. So big delta N over big delta T equals births minus deaths. A lot of this, um, I'm going to really simplify uh, the presentation, even relative to what's given in your book, which is already pretty simple. In your labs with your GSIs, I hope they'll um, add complexity to the presentation. Your labs uh, that you'll perform for the, this section actually are more complex in some of the mathematics. That's great. The GSIs are going to present it uh, however they want, and some of them will um, give more complexity than I will. I'm giving you a, a very simple presentation. I th you know, it's not to say that it's easy, but uh, it's, it's almost as simple as you can get for a population ecology introduction. Going back to our life tables, because it's from these tables um, that we, we generate much of the data necessary for this modeling work. Remember our cute little squirrels from the Sierra Nevada and, um, and the phenomenon of a life table mapping survivorship and mortality across cohorts of squirrels in these different age classes. Note that there's the column here called death rate, which is the number of individuals that die in a particular interval relative to the total number of individuals present. That, that uh, column of information will be carried over in some of our modeling work. And recall also that we distinguish females from males in this process because uh, the statistics for these populations differ. The statistics for these sexes differ within the population. I very briefly mentioned uh, reproductive tables where the life table focuses on survivorship and mortality. The reproductive table emphasizes natality and birth. <coughs> Again structured in terms of cohorts, we have columns representing the proportion of females 
that produce a litter of offspring in a particular interval, age interval. So squirrels under one year old are not producing any offspring. The average size of a litter of offspring, and in that case, the female bears those offspring, of course, but those offspring are both, include both males and females, and both are counted here. Specifically, the number of females in a litter represented here. And finally, the average number of female offspring per individual for that interval, that age interval. This is often the case that only females are focused on in this work. After all, it's only the females that are bearing the young in these sexually reproducing species. And only the females um, need be relevant to the calculations that we'll use. So that's, that's often the case, and the things are simplified in that way. So this, um, this data, these data, are also used in the modeling work that we'll, that we'll focus on now. And of course, th this is for squirrels. Um, other organisms are going to differ in the timing of these events. Some mice, um, some that live right here outside the building, will start breeding in a few weeks of age. So your time intervals would change. And um, you know, at three weeks, they're producing a, a litter. Um, so this is going to be organism specific, in part based on the biology of the specific organism. It may also be environmentally influenced. And those two themes will carry through the discussion here. The intrinsic biology of the organism as it influences life tables and reproductive tables, the life histories of these organisms, as well as environmental and external influences on these life histories and their patterns. Both are important, intrinsic phenomena and extrinsic phenomena. So let's introduce two more terms, and these are, um, these are terms that are derivable from our life tables and reproductive tables, the columns that I hi highlighted. The per capita birth rate, little b, and the per capita death rate, little d. Per capita, right? You've encountered that at some point before. Um, by head, per capita. So according to the number of individual offspring, sorry, according to the number of individuals present. That's what we mean by per capita, right? So a per capita birth rate is the rate of birth relative to the number of individuals present. And the phenomenon of the total number of births in an interval or the total number of deaths is equal to that per capita birth and death rate times the number of existing individuals. So big B equals little b times big N. And big D equals little d times big N. Substituting back into the equation from the previous slide, our change in numbers for a particular time interval is equal to bn minus dn. And moving forward from there, well, we need to, we need to introduce um, another term. And this is little r, our per capita rate of increase. If we're interested in modeling populations over time, we're really interested in the phenomenon of the number of deaths relative to the number of births. And subtracting the deaths from the births, we arrive at a, an estimate of how the population is changing in time. Little r, our per capita rate of increase, or it's variously known, uh, the intrinsic rate of increase, I think your book uses per capita rate of increase. We'll stick with that. Note that if r equals zero, 
if births and deaths are equal, if birth rate and death rate, if birth rates and death rates are equal, um, R will equal zero and total number of individuals in the population won't change over time. There may be a lot going on. There may be lots of individuals being born and lots of individuals dying, but if they cancel each other out, total numbers of individuals will not change. On the other hand, if R is greater than zero, the population will be growing, and if it's less than zero, declining. So if it's negative, it will be declining, positive, growing. See, this is all very handy. Um, there's our um, equation from the previous slide. <coughs> Let's just take N out of that equation. And by substituting in R, the per capita rate of births minus the per capita, capita rate of deaths, substituting R for this term, we arrive at this equation where the change in population number relative to time, an interval of time, is equal to R times N. So let's look at what, what this implies for the shape of a growth curve. But first, let's make it um, a little more realistic because growth doesn't happen in simple intervals for most organisms. Growth happens, population growth happens um, instantaneously. It's happening, births and deaths are happening all the time. Sure, there are very typically <coughs> breeding seasons reproductive seasons and seasons of higher and lesser mortality, but they're not occurring in strict, strictly fixed intervals typically. So we really need an instantaneous uh, rate of change. And to do that, we need to use calculus. But you don't. We're not going to, I'm not going to um, ask you to rely on um, calculus for this. Um, given that you're all over the map in terms of your, uh, your math backgrounds. Maybe your GSIs want you to. That's great if they do. Um, but for, for I'm just going to gloss that step over and, um, and just give you the new term terminology for handling instantaneous rates of change using a differential equation. And so let's that here's our step in doing so, just to replace our big delta with, um, with little d, right? So we have dn dt in the differential equation equals r instantaneous, the instantaneous rate of increase times total population number. And there, your book gives you a couple of definitions of r. Ecologists have struggled with the concept of R for a long time, and there's a lot of very active debate on it. We're going to gloss over that whole debate, and I'll just ask you to, for, for a single understanding of R and a single simple understanding of R, not even divided into an instantaneous R or a maximum R, um, you can just um, work with a single R, single R concept the intrinsic rate of increase. And so this will be the equation we can rely on for the basic modeling of population growth in the absence of constraint. And I'll explain what I mean by that, absence of constraint now. Okay, so dn dt equals r times n, inst our instantaneous rate of population growth, model of population growth. And this is what the shape of it shape of that equation looks like. Over time, the size of the population increases according to a J-shaped curve like this, according to this model of growth. This is exponential growth. So uh, if you let bacteria go wild, um, through fission, 
you can see how quickly they will increase to extraordinary numbers if left unchecked. That's what this phenomenon is, this exponential growth phenomenon. This is what this represents. The steepening of this curve in time, growing all completely out of proportion to um, extrinsic reality, really. Because, of course, if, if, if organisms grow like this, um, they can't do so forever, or we would be swimming in them, right? We're swimming in humans on this planet right now, practically. Um, and humans have followed an extraordinary growth sequence. Um, it's, it's a little funny, minus 8,000 years ago. Um, so 8,000 8, uh, before the Common Era. Um, I just have it labeled a little oddly here. Population growth during these early, ti early times was increasing slowly, steadily, but then faster and faster. And with the Industrial Revolution, pretty coherently following an exponential logistic Sorry, an exponential growth model. And here we are sitting, you know, somewhere, somewhere up in here um, with blips related to mass mortality in the process. <coughs> but the recovery from those, uh, those insults and the continuation of growth. I'll spend a, um, much longer talking about human population growth um, in a later lecture our understanding of this phenomenon has changed so much in the last um, 15 years. It's a really interesting history. Examples from other organisms, um, a local example, elephant seals. You can go to the beaches here, uh, Point Reyes, um, out by the lighthouse, or even better, down at the beaches north of Santa Cruz, like Año Nuevo and see beaches chock-a-block with elephant seals. Big, big animals, right? Huge seals with these proboscises, these noses, these long noses that you know, give them their name, they're elephant seals. The males are much more massive than the females. Um, truly gargantuan creatures. And uh, down at Año Nuevo, you need to make a reservation, but you can walk on the beaches with these guys in close proximity with a guide. And, um, and one of the things that's so remarkable about doing this is that within the last hundred years, the numbers of elephant seals were reduced on the scale of the whole planet to a couple dozen um, by the best estimates. There were maybe 20 individual ele elephant seals on Earth as a result of overhunting in the uh, early 1900s, from uh, so even in the 1960s, according to this data, these data. From those, that original set, you've had an exponential increase and in the occupation of all these beaches along California and elsewhere um, of elephant seals. Yeah. There's not much genetic variation if you're, if you're back here with 20 individuals. And you may have indeed experienced a type of bottleneck where genetic variation was so limited that you might expect to see problems in health of the population over time. Yeah, so this creates a very fragile situation, according to our understanding, in the health of the population. Something I'd love to be building on here, but you'll certainly get exposure to those concepts in, in the evolution section. Yeah, you're right. Nevertheless, you walk among them and you look at these numbers and they look darn healthy. Um, thumbing their big proboscis at such concepts from evolutionary biology, right? Um, there are other examples, real world examples. Elephants in Kruger National Park in northern South Africa. Um, again, they were, they were shot out of the place, um, hunted for um, ivory, uh, hunted for big game trophies. Um, Overexploited, as many mammals across the globe have been, as many organisms have across the globe. 
and maybe particularly the big mammals, biggest mammals. So elephants are of great interest to many people, um, not least the tourist industry of a place like South Africa. So um, conservationists and uh, the general public fought hard to reintroduce and um, care for the elephant population in Kruger. And look what has happened over time. They've done all too well. Um, they've done so well that they're creating problems. They are creating problems for the environment because of their capacity to alter the environment. Elephants knock down trees. Elephant, an elephant can eat a whole tree. It can knock down the tree and eat the leaves and eat, strip the bark and kill the tree. And you get enough elephants and you're going to radically alter the ecosystem for other organisms. You can have too many elephants. Um, and so you had this agonizing situation in a place like this where you have conservationists um, very much interested in preserving elephants and animal rights activists who absolutely don't want elephants harmed in any way and politicians who dearly want to keep the tourist industry going strong and ecologists who are talking to all of these individuals and also trying to say, look, we have a real problem on our hands because of the effects that this great increase in elephant numbers is causing on other organisms. And we need to do something about it. We need to manage this. What do you do? Um, do you sh go around and shoot elephants? Um, for many people, no, absolutely, you do not do that. That's absolutely inhumane. Um, do you go around and, and try to sterilize them so they cease reproduction? Well, you might try, but try, just try. <laughs> um, it's an, an extraordinary challenge. I mean, these are, these are vast spaces, and these are mobile animals with complex life histories. And you might try, but uh, more likely than not, it's not going to work. So you have to make political decisions about whether you're going to go in and shoot, um, try to relocate. If you're going to relocate thousands of elephants, where are you going to put them? Um, it's a really a dramatic problem, and uh, they've struggled with this in recent years. Um, and you can, um, you can read about it online. But do something you must. Uh, really, there is a management uh, necessity here in a situation like that. So exponential growth is real in these systems um, when these organisms are proceeding largely unchecked by other factors their intrinsic capacity for growth being realized or being close to realized without check will give you these types of J-shaped curves and um, these explosions of numbers. Note here the effect that this per capita rate of growth or this intrinsic rate of growth has on the shape of the curve. When it's higher, it leads to a steeper curve. And what dictates are is both partly a function of basic, the basic biology of the organism, but it's also a result of environmental factors, as I'll, try, as I'll try to draw out here. Organisms do not um, increase exponentially forever, or we would be truly swimming in them. Um, why not? They, yes. There are limits to growth, like food av availability. So we will talk about um, the limits to growth in terms of density-independent factors and density-dependent factors. Don't worry about this slide for the moment. Let me first address density-independent factors, for which I don't have a slide. Now let's do it after. I'll ask you about it after, um, since we're already here. Let's focus on density-dependent factors first. And by this we mean factors that influence growth in relation to the density of organisms present. And someone just has mentioned food here, and we can think of resources broadly. Because as numbers of individuals increase in a population, um, competition for resources is typically heightened. And for and resources may be food, but they may be other factors such as space, 
the availability of space in which to live, or something, an abiotic factor like water availability, not exactly food. Um, but very often, there's great evidence in natural populations for relationships like this. With increasing density, measured here by plants per meter squared on a logarithmic scale, relative to some measure of fecundity or of fitness, term you'll get introduced to in evo the evolution section, per individual, you see a decrease in fecundity or fitness relative to numbers, relative to density. And that's um, seen here in, the, in plantain, um, in that plant relative to some um, limitation on resources, probably space, water, light, things like that. Or here in birds, an, in the song sparrow, relative to the number of females in a unit area, the size of the number of eggs laid, the average clutch size. It's a linear decrease, more or less, in the size of the clutch relative to the number of females in an area. Why? Because, um, because food resources are limited in this case, in this study. I forget, uh, this was an island environment where this study was conducted. I forget where it was exactly. But food resources were limited so that the more females the were, there were, the less food there was to go around and the fewer resources that could be dedicated to the production of offspring. It's competition as a result of density, density-dependent competition. And these things affect life history parameters, including, uh, including birth rates and death rates. An example from your book, these heirloom sheep from, uh, that were taken off of uh, the one island where they were continuing to exist. This is the closest relative to our domesticated sheep. They were put onto another island, Hirta Island, in, um, in the early 1900s. And population ecologists have been following them ever since and closely studying them. The percentage of juveniles, the percentage of young sheep that are, that are breeding and producing lambs goes down with increasing numbers. So the more numbers of individuals there are in the population, the fewer young individuals there are reproducing. And that has a great effect on overall population numbers. I'll stress that more later, but that age at first reproduction, the earlier it gets, that can have dramatic effects on population number increases. So if the young individuals are not reproducing as much, that's going to have a big effect on population growth. <coughs> Another example of density dependent effect. So just to summarize for you, um, some of the effects of density that might limit population growth. Um, I focused on resource competition before, but um, think about the fouling of the environment as a result of numbers. Uh, in, a, in a dish like this, numbers could increase following a more or less exponential curve, but as a result of the production of waste, the environment may become less and less suitable for growth and numbers will be curtailed as a result. Territoriality among individuals. As density increases, as numbers increase, sometimes organisms become more and more aggressive in their defense of their territories, and that can start to constrain population growth. This you will probably have encountered, the fact that in populations with greater numbers and higher density, parasites and pathogens and disease may be more likely to um, propagate and, and, um, and those can have checks on population growth with increasing numbers of individuals. If, o if only because greater densities lead to um, the ease with which uh, parasites and pathogens can be passed through sneezing or coughing or phenomenon like that <laughs> among humans. <coughs> um, predation. If you 
as the numbers of or individual organisms in a population go up, they may become focused on by predators. So they become less, um, and you can think about this in terms of optimal foraging strategy of the predators themselves. As the numbers of individuals in a prey population go up, predators may turn their focus to those prey populations as a result of their greater ease of capture because of their abundance. That can serve as a check on, their po on the growth of those populations. Probably here I can mention um, density independent forces. Um, you, can, you can pretty much, um, for my purposes, relate the density independent forces that might provide checks on populations to uh, environmental, abiotic factors. Um, can someone give me an example of a, a force that might act to curtail growth that's not related to the density of individuals present? Yes, please. Uh, volcano. A volcano, excellent. A volcano erupts, and it doesn't matter if there are 300 of you or 20 of you. If you're there, you will be scorched. <laughs> Drought, ditto, yes. Droughts, um, if, if there is not enough water present, um, it's probably not relevant how dense your population is. If you don't have enough water, you won't be able to survive. Someone else? I mean, we get the theme already um, of these environmental forces that, um, that act without reference to density. Those are good ones. It's often subtle, though. If you think of um, a cold snap, a freezing event, um, let's say relative to our, our eucalyptus grove here. Eucalyptus here don't do that well with, uh, with very cold temperatures. So if it, if it freezes over the, you know, if it goes below freezing the temperature over the course of the night, um, you might expect that that's going to influence all trees in a population equally because if their tissues reach a certain uh, low temperature, they will die. They will not be able to survive it. But think about that a little more. If there are 100 eucalyptus packed into a small space, might they not uh, bumper the temperature effect in the interior relative to the edges? Um, say if there are 100 of them packed into a space rather than five, if there are only five big eucalyptus, they might all die because the temperature uh, won't vary across that space. But if there are 100, there may be a buffer. So it's often a little bit subtle, but um, you can tease that apart um, to the degree you're, you like. Now I'm going to um, complicate the traditional story a little bit further. Your book introduces the phenomenon of alley, an alley effect. And I'll, um, I think it's really important because that the classic um, model of increasing density and its effect on population numbers in a negative pattern um, does not always hold for organisms in two respects. And this, this effect is named after Warder Clyde Ali, a very interesting ecologist from the University of Chicago. Um, he wasn't actually that small. That's the only picture I could find of him. Very, very uh, great thinking ecologist uh, who saw that for some populations, um, when they went below some critical threshold in their numbers, they could suffer increasing mortality or reductions in natality that might drive them to extinction. Remember from the traditional models, if population numbers are low, we should expect increased growth. <coughs> That's what those curves all look like, in part as a result of the availability of resources in populations with low numbers. But what if your population numbers are so low that it's just hard to find a mate? And that could be true for plants or, or animals. Um, if you think of plants uh, with pollinators, if plants are so widely separated and so, um, so rare, the pollinators may not be able to take the pollen to the female organs of another plant um, for reproduction. Or if you have 
two tigers in a forest, uh, one's a male and one's a female, great. But if that forest is, uh, you know, a thousand square kilometers, they just might not be able to find each other. So below a certain threshold, populations may be so low in numbers that there's a negative that over time, population numbers further decline. I could give you other examples, and if I have time, I will. Um, that's the way your book presents it, as this negative phenomenon. But there's another aspect um, to the Ali effect in another part of this curve that's also relevant. Uh, barely showing up here is your, your, your line of standard negative density dependence. That's this dotted line, okay? Note that above this threshold, increasing density has an actually a positive effect on R, on the per capita growth rate. So there's a negative effect in this region, but a positive effect in this region. So the LE effect does not always only involve a negative effect. Let me give you another example. First, let me, um, let me just give you a definition here on the board um, that might help with, you, with this. Because this, this will cause a bit of confusion. But I want this confusion to be productive because it's going to get you to think about, um, about these growth phenomena and, um, and to recognize the simplicity of the traditional, the traditional introduction. So this region of the negative effect, and this is all under the... Um, Le effect, okay. The region of negative effect so below some critical threshold and you can call it the Le threshold if you want. R, little r, decreases with population size or density. <laughs> All right. In this region of positive effect, R increases. With density. Until it's it's checked. Until it's overpowered by um, by negative feedback. Until checked. Okay. I gave you the example of um, maybe the the problem of finding mates. Um, can someone think of another example of where Ali effects might be important in a population? Something not related to mate finding at all? Yes. Sorry, up here. Yes, great example. For predatory behavior if an organism hunts in packs. Um, wild dogs in Africa have been studied in this regard. Wild dogs are you know, fairly small dogs that run very fast, that hunt in packs to overpower much larger animals. When their numbers get below a certain density, when, they, when the populations become um, below a certain threshold, they just don't have the numbers to be able to hunt. And they can spiral toward extinction locally um, as a result. Great example. Anyone want to try another one? Yes. In defense, exactly. Yeah, that's another good one. It's, um, it's sort of the opposite of uh, the predation situation. In defense, he said schooling fish in defense. Um, if a school of fish, the numbers become so low, they don't have the proper defensive mechanisms and are more easily picked off as individuals and may spiral to local extinction. That can be true for many other types of organisms. So you can see how that is related to the negative 
region of effect, but also the positive region, because once numbers increase to a certain point, then they do have that capacity to hunt well or to defend themselves and will increase further. And please try to see how that's really counter to the traditional, um, the traditional ra relationship between density and R or some other measure that looks like that. Okay, so food for your thought, hopefully. We will just get to cover the, um, a, the logistic growth model here um, at the end. And then you are all off on a great weekend, I hope. But hang with me for five more minutes. So we'll introduce a new term, K. Um, and, you know, again, really simple here. Um, we're really dumbing it down by saying it's the maximum population size that an environment can sustain, but that's fine. Um, the K is our carrying capacity. It's, it's not a fixed value, as we'll see. It's, it varies over time and it varies over space. Um, it's very important in our modeling work here. We have our previous equations to build on. So let's modify our differential equation with this extra term, the carrying capacity minus the total number of individuals in the population divided by the carrying capacity. And let's try to see the effect that the addition of this term has on the shape of our curve. Here's our J-shaped curve up to this point. By adding the following our typical exponential. As K is approached, as the carrying capacity of the environment is approached, note how the population growth becomes an asymptote to, asymptote to that line. How the curve goes from being J-shaped to S-shaped. This is the shape of the curve modeled by that equation. Let's try to bear out what that means a little bit as we go. So that's just uh, a more up-close view of the same. So think about it. If K is at this level, say it's 100. So if K is 100, as N increases, the number of individuals in the population increases from 50 to 60 to 70, the numerator here is going to get smaller and smaller to the point where the numerator will equal, will to, to the point where the numerator will go to zero and render this side of the equation zero, such that the increase in numbers in time will be zero, and you will see zero population growth. So as the carrying capacity is approached, by population numbers, you will reach this asymptote of zero population growth and no increase in population size. Okay? Two more minutes. Got you for two minutes, you guys. Um, so in, this is observed, this type of growth as exponential growth has real-world examples and can be observed in nature and in the laboratory, uh, logistic growth has been observed in both settings. In lab ecosystems, I mean, a ver whole variety of organisms have been shown to follow a curve like this. Here's an example from Paramecia, but various other organisms. Often it's not as simple as an S. Often there's a time lag in the effect of whatever countering forces they are that draw the population towards some carrying capacity. So there's often an overshoot as a result of a time lag before the population settles um, back down to, toward K. And we'll leave it at that. Have a great weekend. <laughs>